Nickelback fans in Portugal! Oh man, classic internet right here. Check out that 144p resolution. You wanna hear some rock and roll or you wanna go home? And here's where he gets hit with the rock. See ya! Yeah, yeah, I remember this. We used to pass this video around and just laugh. Oh, <sighs> Different times, right? Because it sure seems like things have turned around a lot for Nickelback. How the hell do we wind up like this? For a good like 10 years there, Canadian grunt rockers Nickelback were one of the biggest whipping boys in pop culture. A nice, reliable punchline that you could use as casual shorthand for shitty music. Bad music makes people violent. Like Nickelback <laughs> makes me want to kill Nickelback. <laughs> It all feels now like an artifact of a completely different era, and the backlash to the backlash seems kind of inevitable. I mean, all that hate for a band who didn't do anything except make music that you didn't like? Like, what's the big deal? My friends that are super cool despise Nickelback. Yeah. You wait tables. They sell out arenas. And I think that's come around to not just avoiding the jokes, but actually starting to appreciate their music. Nickelback gets way too much shit. I think that this is a jam of what I really am. Like, they weren't as big as they were for no reason, right? Show some respect. So these days, it seems like people are more inclined to defend them than anything. I am not one of those people. I staked my claim in 2003, and I see no reason to move. I say we could have left Nickelback's name on the worst band ever banner. I would have been perfectly okay with that. That said, this long after their heyday, it is a little easier to have a more balanced look at them. And even though I'm not a fan, I'd agree that Nickelback jokes are hacky. Last year I watched Only Murders in the Building on Hulu take a cheap shot at them, and I swear to God, I got offended on their behalf. I need a new Oklahoma. I will not be the one-hit wonder of true crime podcasts, Poppy. I won't. I will not be podcast Nickelback. What? What the fuck are you talking about, Tina Fey? What do you think their one hit even is? They had tons of hits. That was the problem. Look at this photograph. The backlash to Nickelback was always more about quantity than quality. There are tons of bands who sucked worse, but there were none who sucked more. If you were a radio listener in the 2000s, which most people were, you could hate Nickelback and still know dozens of their songs. That's just not okay. I don't have to go and try and win over someone who doesn't like my band. That sounds like a, some very strange form of torture, um, for probably for both of us. <laughs> oh, it was, Chad. I mean, I'd have loved to have avoided you too, but I didn't really have a choice, now did I? If I can switch to praise for a moment, one thing I do appreciate about Nickelback is their willingness to switch things up. They got tagged as repetitive early in their careers because their first two big albums had near identical lead singles. and. I feel like even now, that's the image that's stuck to them. Honestly, I don't agree with that. Now Creed, that was a monotonous band, but Nickelback had more range. They're always Nickelback, obviously, but you wouldn't mistake Rockstar for Photograph. You wouldn't mistake How You Remind Me for This Afternoon. So you'd think they'd be able to adapt to whatever, but that's not what happened. Around the turn of the 2010s, they just dropped off the face of the earth. And you can mark their slow decline pretty easily. Around 2005 and 6, they had about a dozen hit singles. In 2008 and 9, they had a dozen more radio singles, but no one really remembers them anymore. In 2011, they had another platinum album, but it didn't have any singles at all. And then finally, we get to 2014's No Fixed Address, when the Nickelback train finally ground to a halt. Didn't get radio play, didn't sell. Their first album since their breakthrough to not go platinum or even gold. At long last, we, the haters of the world, had bullied Nickelback out of the public sphere. So what finally ended them? Just the overwhelming backlash? Yeah, probably. But this is my show, Train Records. I cover colossal flops. And as I just showed you, the decline of Nickelback was actually fairly gradual. And as you already know, if an artist shows up on this show, despite having a fairly ordinary career decline, that can only mean they did something funny. Friends, do you want to know what Nickelback was doing 10 years ago? I got some stuff getting kind of funky. The album was called No Fixed Address, and fittingly, the result was the most all over the place record they ever made. What? 
what on earth is happening right now? Chad Kroger never made it as a wise man, couldn't cut it as a poor man stealing, and he absolutely did not pull off whatever this was. Hey, hey, they want to be a pop star. Well, too bad. This is Train Records. My holy grail of lost media is a song that I have always, always, always wanted to get my hands on, but I have never heard, no one has ever heard, may not even have ever been recorded. It's registered on ASCAP, but it has never been released, and it's called I Admit That There Was Music, written by Chad Kroger and Carly Rae Jepsen. Yes, the glamorous pop star and the grunting butt rocker made a song together, a collaboration only possible in the incestuous Canadian music industry. Which of them was it for? Was it a duet? What could it even sound like? And what a title, too. I admit that there was music. I mean, I admit there was music. You'll never hear it, though. You will hear this. Uh, rock and roll! Traveling a million miles an hour. This is Million Miles an Hour, the song that kicks off Nickelback's eighth album, No Fixed Address. And, um... Am I wrong, or does this not suck? Insanity is setting in, reality is getting thin. Semi-defenders of Nickelbacks will tell you that the band's hard rockers are better than their slower stuff. Honestly, I never really liked those either, but this one, I don't know. I saw a couple reviews of this album that made fun of this line. Speaking to the galaxy, received and sending back to me. I can finally hear the speed of sound. Haha, <laughs> what? You can't hear the speed of sound. Huh. Eh, fuck off, that line's good, actually. The speed of sound. I don't know, this seems a little better than what I expected. I can admit that. I listened to the song, I wouldn't at all have guessed that this is the band that killed rock. Alright, 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 hold on. Let's examine that statement. Did Nickelback kill rock? Or at least, were they responsible for rock's massive decline in relevance? The answer is no. No, obviously no. Well, maybe. I've been reading some deep dives on what exactly led to the decline of rock, but the short answer is that in the 90s, rock was a big tent. You could listen to Green Day, and then you could listen to Metallica, and for the most part, no one complained. If you put on Nine Inch Nails, the nerds and the alt kids would listen, but so would the metalheads, and the rednecks, the wasteoids, sportos, dweebies, dickheads, and so on. But in the 2000s, it started to fracture. The hipsters would not listen to the butt rock, or vice versa, and neither side was big enough to sustain rock on its own, so tons of rock stations went under, or they had to switch formats. And if rock and roll was killed by this divided audience, then surely the biggest individual blame has to go to Nickelback, the most divisive band of them all. That's obviously putting too much on them. They weren't the only band like that. But it's funny to think that Nickelback basically wrote their own downfall, not just by engendering such a backlash in themselves, but destroying the infrastructure that could have sustained them. But in the year 2014, Nickelback frontman slash bellowing troll demon Chad Kroger was not yet ready to throw in the towel and let the band head towards its legacy years. Surely he could write more hits, just like he'd written so many before. Thus, one last stab at getting back on top. The album's new. It's Brand so new. If you like the old cereal, we're hoping you're going to like the new cereal. That's not to say that it's going to taste the same, but we hope you like it. But again, it's 2014. The 2000s are over. George W. Bush left the White House years ago. Rock is dead. Megan Trainer is one of the biggest names in music. The environment is not good. And not just for rock and roll, but for Nickelback specifically. Okay, the backlash against you guys playing the Lions Packers game Thanksgiving is bad. It can't be that bad. Can't be that bad. Okay, dude from Nickelback. You can't really measure these things, but I would say that their reputation is at its lowest point. That song I was playing, the opener. Actually, it's fine. It's perfectly fine. But there's no commercial appetite for just another run-of-the-mill hard rock barn burner. If they want to get back on top, they're going to need a real hook. Something timely. Something distinctly 2010s. Something like...
You must be joking. That's right, Nickelback are gonna get political. Are you ready to Nickelback against the machine, everyone? Here is the lead single, Edge of a Revolution. Revolution. You say you want a revolution. Oh well, you know. Who knew that Nickelback, of all bands, had strong feelings about capitalism? <laughs> yeah, How You Remind Me is actually how you remind me that the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act was an atrocity. Allegedly, Kroger was inspired to write this by the sight of people marching in the streets. And not just in America. You can see, uh pictures of the Arab Spring going on in the background, which Kroger says was another inspiration. <sighs> and there's also some other politics. Hey, hey, just obey your secret safe with the NSA. Nickelback says, free Snowden. Whew, what a time 2014 was. I'll be dead if the shit don't change. Okay, obviously Nickelback is no rise against or anything. Also, a lot of this stuff was already passe by 2014. Occupy and the Arab Spring was three years passed by then. But Kroger says that he felt this was still timely because right as they were working on this, another protest started breaking out, so he felt the time was right. Stand up! Stand up! Yeah, he never says anything explicit about it, but subtextually, this is their BLM song. Nickel Black Lives Matter. What do we want? Oh, we want change! And are we gonna get their revolution? All right, so... Let's say their hearts are in the right place. Sure. And let's say that this doesn't sound like absolute ass either. I'll give them that. They've made message songs before and those did sound like ass. They're the worst songs in their catalog, but that's because they were so sappy and Nickelback can't pull that off. This one's angry and that fits their sound much better. So I will grant you all of that. This song still really, really does not work. Okay, something I realized doing the Billy Idol episode the one where he wrote a song about the LA riots. I realized that if you're gonna make music that ties to a social movement, you can't just support it and agree with it. You have to sound like it. One interesting thing that happened during the 2020 protest is that Dior by Pop Smoke became the unofficial anthem. Dior is not a protest song in any way. But it was a song that was popular at the time with protesters, so it became a Black Lives Matter anthem because, because that's how subtext works. Nickelback, meanwhile, making an Occupy anthem does not work because they're an intrinsically backwards looking band. There's a decent argument that no rock band in 2014 would sound like a revolution, but Nickelback especially. What do we want? Oh, we want change! I mean, yeah, we did want change. That's why you guys aren't famous anymore. You said it, not me. So Nickelback's brand of rock does not at all fit the moment. It also just doesn't feel like they actually care. God we trust or the CIA. Like, I don't know what their actual politics are, but this sounds like a Hail Mary from a band with floundering prospects. They sound like bandwagon jumpers. It's like how I watch and enjoy plenty of political YouTubers, but I'm not one myself. If I started adding 20 minutes about capitalism to the end of my videos, it would suck, and you would be able to tell. I'm sure Chad has political opinions, I do too, and I bring them up sometimes, but it's just not something I feel driven to talk about, and I just don't think it drives these guys either. The words aren't necessarily wrong, but they are lumpy and cliche, and this just doesn't seem like something that drives them creatively. And I don't think their fans really took to it either. What do we want? We want I mean, that's some tepid fist pumping there. I have no idea what the actual politics of Nickelback fans are. I'm guessing that, yes, a lot of Nickelback fans probably were angry at the banks and the NSA, but it's the kind of demographic that listens to Joe Rogan now, not necessarily the people who are out there occupying Wall Street. Again, it's the same divide that killed rock radio. It just doesn't work. Shockingly, Edge of a Revolution did not become Bernie Sanders' campaign theme. But really, I don't think it was the mismatch of artists to cause that did it. I just think their style was out of date. Especially their decision to shackle themselves to this archaic instrument. Does anyone even know what this thing is called? I think I saw a bard play it at a Ren Faire once. 
See, without rock radio, Nickelback would have to rely on the pop stations, which had always been kind to them. And despite its plummet in relevance, rock music, or, you know, rock music, was still finding its way to cross over, but the electric guitar was not the lead instrument anymore. It was used for texture, if it was even used at all. And that's why the big bands were now Bastille, Foster the People, and of course the band that replaced Nickelback as the overplayed whipping boys of mainstream rock, Imagine Dragons. So, uh, I mean, that's your target, guys. That's who you need to be emulating. So come on, let's do it. Let's imagine some fucking dragons. This is their new album, No Fixed Aggression, just came out today here with the song, What Are You Waiting For? Nickelback. Are you waiting on a lightning strike? Are you waiting for the perfect night? Are you waiting till the time is right? What are you waiting for? This is the second single, and the one clearly meant to be the radio hit, What Are You Waiting For? What are you waiting for? Look, I am not the right guy to tell you if Nickelback are doing something wrong because I never liked them to begin with. But Nickelback doing this kind of synth-heavy, very 2010s sounding production, it, it, it's odd, right? It doesn't sound right, it doesn't match. Are you waiting for the right excuse? Are you waiting for a sign to choose? An important thing to note about this record is that for the first time since 2002, they are working without their main producer. That guy's name is Joey Moy. That's actually him in the photograph. And what the hell is on Joey's head? Yeah, what the hell is that on his head? But by the 2010s, Joey had moved to Nashville, become a big name in country music, and is a big reason why country music all sounds the way it does now. Meanwhile, Nickelback decided that they would handle production, for the most part, by themselves. I, I guess it gives them the opportunity to stretch? Whatever you want to say about Nickelback, and specifically Joey Moy's influence on them, you can't deny that they got results. Moy knew what they sounded like and worked to enhance that and it paid off for them. They had a signature sound. This though, I just don't think it sounds right at all. Tell me what you waiting for. Tell me what you waiting for. Show me what you waiting for. The backing is too pretty for Kroger the Ogre's horrible fucking voice. Like yes, they were always a commercial band, but there are limits. Chad's voice needs a kind of grounding that comes from an actual physical guitar. If you're gonna get your Coldplay on, you have to also write like Coldplay. And this is just the same boring love ballad bullshit they always write. Okay, so those were the first two singles, and except for a tiny bit of rock play, which doesn't really count for much, neither of these did much of anything. So relevant topics aren't doing it, trying to adapt to the new sound of rock isn't doing it. You know what it is? It's an image problem. There's a reason why every time you talk about Nickelback, you talk about the backlash and whether they deserved it. It's because, what else is there to talk about? Nickelback is a very drab band. Their color palette is muddy. Their lead singer is not much to look at. Kroger has complained that they'd take a hundred photos for photo shoots where they look like fun, cool guys, and then the outlet will always publish the one where they're going, Urgh. Always the same thing. All right, guys, give me a little bit of attitude. <laughs> and so we all do that thing, and we all kind of stand there and do one of these, and then they, and that's the picture that's that gets the Well, I mean, that's what you guys sound like, man. That's why they picked that. No one cared about Chad Kroger as a person. Even marrying Avril Lavigne couldn't get people to care about them. Did you know his name's not even Chad Kroger? It's pronounced Kruger. Why don't you fucking say something, man? Well, it's Kroger now, goddammit. Too late now. This deep into the nickel backlash, they had to know they had image problems, and I think they were trying to fix this. Chad has a decent haircut for probably the first time in his entire career. I mean, Christ, look at this photograph. What is that, the Lisa Kudrow? That should have been fixed a long time ago, but you know what? No time like the present. You know what, man? Fuck it. Fuck it. Go all out. You're the biggest goddamn band of your generation. You're superstars, man. Act like it. Get your Hollywood on. Wait. Are sure this is the right place? Yes. Come on, children. And here we go. She's got me nervous, talking a hundred miles an hour. This is the third single, She Keeps Me Up, about having sex with a sexy lady. I love when she says, What's wrong with right here on the counter? 
I'm gonna guess most of you didn't know this existed, which I think that's a pretty telling sign of how far they'd fallen because I don't know how everyone doesn't know about this. I mean, look at them. Disco back. Oh my god, there's a woman on this track. Wow. Has there ever been a band with less feminine energy than Nickelback? Adding a backup singer is like eating a tuna sandwich with sprinkles on it. And for the record, if this trick works on anyone, it should be me. I fucking love it when pop stars do a rock song, and I love it when rock bands do a dance song. The only Maroon 5 song I actually like is basically that. Cause there is precedent for this. Clearly what they're thinking of is Paralyzer by Finger Eleven, another mook rock band that got a flute crossover hit with a disco song. No one thinks about that song anymore, but I liked it at the time. Mega Platinum Nickelback surely has better pop instincts than a two-hit wonder like Finger Eleven. They can pull this trick too. Okay, but here's why this one doesn't work for me. Believe it or not, it's not because the song goes funky little monkey. Well, that doesn't help. Maybe don't call any woman that, ever. But that's not why. The real problem is, Nickelback is no fun. They have a bunch of songs like this. I mean, not like this, but like songs about fucking and girls and strip clubs and whiskey and shit. And I just can't enjoy them because Kroger's voice has always just struck me as intrinsically malevolent. He sounds like an evil, nasty person. I don't think he actually is in real life, but that's what he sounds like. My favorite song by them is Figured You Out, which is by far their most morally reprehensible single. It's the only song they have that matches their ugly, ugly aesthetics. So when he's singing like, Funky little monkey, she's a twisted sister, I mean, it sounds so gross. I mean, they're terrible lyrics, but ACDC would make it work. But here, it's not fun sleaze, it's just nasty. And not good nasty, I mean like gas station bathroom floor nasty. That's not good when this is supposed to be their glam song. Finger Eleven were hardly a dance act, but they smartly wrote Paralyzer as an ironic club song for people who hate clubs. Nickelback plays there straight down the line and it just reads as embarrassing. There were a couple other videos for this album, which is impressive considering it was clear by this point that the album wasn't doing much. This is a song called Get Em Up, about bank robbers. This is a robbery, now get down on the floor. It's fine, I guess. It's the first song on the album where I wasn't asking what the fuck they were doing. Honestly, I think it's kind of a tragedy that they didn't have this kind of production to begin with, because honestly, I think this sounds a lot less like butt than they usually do. Uh, what I don't like is that it ends with a comedy bit. The only thing I wish that one of us had known That it was Sunday and the goddamn bank was closed What I'm getting from this album is an attempt to loosen the fuck up. Which is admirable, but not really successful. Nickelback were big fans and friends of ZZ Top, but you imagine ZZ Top doing this song and the difference is just obvious. Humor is just not what Nickelback does. No, it's late, but something's on my mind. This was followed by Satellite, which actually continues the story of the previous video. The male model looking bank robber escapes on the lam and he and his model girlfriend break into a rich guy's house and live it up. It's supposed to be romantic. This idiot just tried to rob a bank on a Sunday, but sure, romantic. Look, when Nickelback haters try and explain why they're so bad, they always say that they're bland. I'm a hater too, but I don't think they were bland. If only. But here I think Chad has in fact sufficiently watered himself down that Yes, I actually think this is genuinely bland. Good job. But those are both some comparatively normal tracks on an otherwise very odd album. Like here's one where they try to get all symphonic. I don't know, I guess they wanted to sound like Trans-Siberian Orchestra for one song. This album is called No Fixed Address for a reason. This all over the map record was literally recorded all over the map. They all have families now and they all live in different places, so 
to make it easier, they recorded parts of it in different cities so that at least one of them could be around their kids while they were making it. Been recording all over the place. We've been recording in uh, L.A. and Vancouver and Maui and uh, all Surrey. Surrey. Mm -hmm. And they even recorded it in a mobile rig while they were on tour in Europe. I don't know if that was the intention, but you feel it in the record. There is just no cohesion at all. Here's one where they have some indie rock whistling and glockenspiel. But you still look the same. You can't fault a band for expanding its range, but none of it solves any of my basic problems with Nickelback, which is that they still sound like Nickelback. And finally, here's one where they try to get funky again. I got some stuff getting kind of funky. This clip will haunt me. But here it goes. It's called Got Me Running Round. Yes! Nickel Funk! In interviews, Chad was real proud of this one. They're like, oh man, check it out. We got the groove. We got the horn section that played on Thriller. Check this out. Look, my first temptation is to call this just panicky selling out. But let's take Chad's interest in other genres seriously for a second. Chad Kroger claims to have eclectic taste. He says he used to listen to all the pop and country music that his metalhead friends looked down on. He was married to Avril Lavigne. He co-wrote her entire fifth album. He made a couple pop hits with Santana. He wrote a song with Carly Rae Jepsen, which again, I must hear at some point. And if you listen to the album before this, you can hear them starting to experiment with more pop sounds. So this didn't come out of nowhere. It's a genuine progression of their sound. Honestly, I like this better than the other dance song. I don't think this sounds terrible. Those horns are good. So despite how easy it would be, believe it or not, I don't think I would call this selling out. Until this. <laughs> Yes! Yes! Oh, get ready to enjoy your bottles and models, shoddies, because it's Flow Rider. You know, Flow Rider. Yay! How did this happen? According to Chad, this was Flow Rider's idea. They were working in the same studio, or their engineer was also working on something with Flow Rider or something like that. But Flow Rider heard this and was like, man, I gotta get on this beat. I am dubious. Regardless of how it happened, there is no way at all that this was an artistic decision. There was no way at all that they were thinking, the thing that would make this song perfect is a rap verse, and I know just the guy. Flo Rida is the guy you get when you want a rapper, but not necessarily any rapper in particular. And as always, Flo Rida delivers his indecipherable gibberish. I ain't going nowhere, going nowhere. And there's just absolutely no way to listen to this without concluding massive fucking sellouts. The existence of a track from Nickelback, the whitest band on earth, a band that claps on the one and three without fail, trying to get with the rap music. Ah, oh, it's made this record all worth it. And with that, I am ready to call it a rap on this record. She's got me around, around, around. So, what do we do with this? I just, I, I honestly don't know. This did nothing to put them back in the limelight. It didn't get back the casuals. It doesn't seem like the hardcore faithful liked it either. It's hard for me to gauge how the fans felt, but I think in general, I think it was mixed to negative. If this album was gonna succeed at all, it was gonna have to rope in the pop audience that they'd lost, and it did not do that. And considering Nickelback's reputation at the time, it's possible they could have never done it even with their very best music. Even the remaining rock stations didn't really take to it. Nickelback have made a couple more records since then, and it's been strictly back to basics. Probably for the best. I came away from this album with both more and less respect for Nickelback. I saw that they had more range than I had given them credit for, and their heavy tracks have only gotten more credible the less famous they've gotten. But their limitations also became so much clearer. And worst of all, I just had no emotional reaction to anything they made. When the Imagine Dragons backlash happened, you could see it affecting them. You could hear their music getting angrier. 
I was one of their first haters. I found their music bombastically vacant. But hearing them frustrated and lashing back made me connect with them for the first time in a while. It didn't necessarily work, but they gave me something I could feel. Nickelback could have harnessed the energy of their unpopularity too, but they just didn't. They actually have a documentary about being hated. It's not out yet, but the early festival reviews all say it deep dives into basically nothing about them. Not about the band, or its music, or its backlash. Those reviewers sound like how I feel listening to this record. I wouldn't say this for their entire catalog, but what I heard in No Fixed Address is a band whose music is just not an expression of their souls in any way. It sounds like their only artistic ambition was to get back on the radio. And even as a non-fan, that was honestly very disappointing to me. But on the plus side, they're not a cheap punchline anymore, even if a few snobs like myself continue to shit on them. Nickelback are a lot less annoying when you don't have to hear them, as opposed to many other artists who still infuriate me no matter how long they've been gone from my life. Last year, She Keeps Me Up even went viral for a minute on TikTok. Who might have begrudged that? You keep doing you, Nickelback, and I'll keep doing me. You should release the Carly Rae song, though. I mean, you released a song with Flo Rida, you can put out something with Carly Rae on it, goddamn. And one last thing. Speaking of people we made too much fun of ten years ago, you know this clown, right? Well, Lindsay Ellis has a new video up about the rise, fall, and redemption of one Guy Fieri, the Food Network host who survived being clowned on for years to become oddly wholesome. And you can watch that video exclusively on Nebula, a creator-specific platform where you can watch great videos from other creators like H Bomber Guy, Adam Neely, and myself. Or if you want to know more about music, check out Volksgeist's video essay on Danger Music, a thorough exploration of music that could literally kill you. As in, you are in physical harm's way every time you hear it performed. That's a real thing. And that one is also a Nebula original. You can watch it only on Nebula. And now if you sign up with my link, you get free access to Nebula Classes, where our creators host classes on how to be a creator. You will not only get access to all of the great stuff Nebula offers, plus classes, but you will get it for a little over $2.50 a month. And you'd also be directly supporting me, which, you know, I'd appreciate it. So click the link in the description and check it out below. Thank you for listening, and good night.